This is the Open University. Good afternoon, students. Um, it's time for another lecture, uh, another um, peek into what's rattling around in my brain. And today it's um, stuff to do with uh, this man behind me, who is Guy Debord, who in 1967 published uh, The Society of Spectacle, which was uh, an amazingly prescient take on the world we still very much live in, a world dominated by uh, images in which relationships between people are mediated by images. Um, God knows in the age of Instagram, in the age when you see people's first reaction to any new experience is to find the, um, the Instagrammable spot from which it will be visible and which will make other people on social media envy them for being there. These are all the first things they see rather than simply the spatial and experiential um, moment of encountering this new thing. So um, this is all um, really confirming what Guy Debord spoke about. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting for me as a Scot. Um, in Scotland, we, we really have uh, industrialised the festival that's just about to come up, the Winter Festival, which we know as Hogmanay, or Hogmanay, it's pronounced in Scotland. Um, and uh, here in Germany, where I live, uh, it's called Sylvester, and it has quite different cultural contours. Sylvester is really... Um, it's a strange kind of what I call repressive desublimation, or what Marcuse called repressive desublimation, a sort of toxic inebriation, literally with alcohol, but also with the, the sound of mortar fire. To me, it sounds like mortar fire. These huge fireworks are released and thrown at people as they walk by on the street from balconies, thrown into underground trains. There's a kind of sense of disorder which spills out over German society, really just at two points of the year, which I've noticed, which is January the 1st and May the 1st. And they're both um, rather dangerous kind of civil war kind of atmosphere. You feel like you're in Lebanon or, you know, somewhere. Um, a bit like the Brixton riots. When I walked through the middle of the Brixton riots in the early 80s, and I think 84, 85, um, that sense of a city just spilling over into disorder. And um, when I first moved to Berlin in the early 21st century, May the 1st was, it genuinely did involve a lot of burned cars and people throwing cobblestones at the police and things like that. It was more of that 1968 kind of May uh, situation. Whereas now it's become a bit more um, organized and spectacular. And this is what we see in Edinburgh uh, with Hagmane. When I was a teenager, Hagmane was a free-for-all. It was like those rugby scrums in which a whole town is playing a kind of rule-free rugby <laughs> against each other. Um, except that instead of tackling people, you were kissing people. There was this amazing kind of, and this was pre-AIDS, of course, uh, pre all the hygienic kind of concerns which came up with, with the AIDS era in the 80s. Uh, in, in, say, 1979, you would go up on, on the last day of the year to the high street and then as midnight came, there would be this huge surge of excitement and uh, uh, a huge repressive desublimation, if you like, because everybody would start kissing everybody else and wishing them Happy New Year. And so I remember kissing the, the daughters of a, friend, a family friend of ours, the Lethams, um, Delia and uh, uh, Susie Letham, who were kind of people you I would never have kissed. They were, you know, attractive teenage girls and I was a, a teenage boy, <laughs> a teenage virgin. Um, who wouldn't dare have made any approaches to them, except when you would meet them on the street at New Year's, New Year's Day, you know, the early hours of New Year's Day. And then you could actually go and kiss them on the mouth. You know, people would kiss strangers on the mouth. And people would jump on bus shelters. And there was a seething kind of mass of humanity, no cars, you know, just sort of these, uh, these crowds in the city centre of people embracing strangers and saying, Happy New Year. Um, now... Uh, Really, in the intervening time, the 40 years since then, it's been a kind of mediatization. And what you get now is, first of all, you get gates around the city centre. Uh, and there's a company called Underbelly, which charges people to enter their own city centre uh, to experience. Well, what do they experience? They see big video screens. They see maybe my cousin, Justin, playing a concert in the Princess Street Gardens or somewhere. Um, they see a... a, a 
a series of entertainments, including fireworks, which have been um, selected by this company in, in cahoots with the Edinburgh Council. So um, it's, it's, there's been a lot of protest and a lot of articles in papers like The Guardian and The Observer this year about the fact that people who live in the city centre have had to apply. It's a bit like the, the sort of toxic environment and we're seeing in Brexit, people having, who've lived in Britain for decades having to reapply for their right to permanent residency or their right to remain, as it's called. You have a right now to remain in your own house in Edinburgh, uh, to enter it. It reminds me a bit of 9-11 when you had to prove to the police that you actually lived in the downtown area, as I did at the time, um, that had been cordoned off and sectioned off because of the uh, attacks on the World Trade Center. Now this attack, is, again, you know, that was an example of Deborian spectacle when 9-11 happened. It was designed to be seen. It was a spectacular terrorist attack in every sense of the word spectacle. Um, now we have this spectacle in Edinburgh city centre where um, you, know, you have to re-establish your credentials as a city centre house um, owner. And if you want to have, you're, you're given a wristband by this company Underbelly. And then if you want to invite people to your own alternative New Year's Day party, you, or first foot, you know, whatever. This is a, the first footing is when you go and ring somebody's bell and be the first person to visit them in that year. You know, this is a Scottish tradition part of Hugmanay. Um, you have to um, show your wristband and, and, and apply to the company for extra wristbands for all your potential guests. It's unworkable, completely unworkable. Um, so there's quite rightly been a scandal about the privatization of public space. Um, this is something that many friends of mine are very concerned about just now. I have a, a friend who works at Edinburgh College of Art called Emma Balkind, whose uh, PhD was about the commons, uh, the idea of commonly owned space and, and how this is being eroded by privatization, commercialization. Um, literally putting gates around the city centre, which then people are having to pay large... I don't know what the tickets are to get in for the Hugmanay celebration. It might be 25 quid or something. Underbelly, who organises this, is also a company that is, uh, to a large extent, organising some of the, f the festival fringe. So a lot of the same critiques um, apply to the Hugmanay celebrations that we're applying to the, the Summer Arts Festival in Edinburgh. Um, and I addressed this back in August when I talked about a, a guy called Bonnie Prince Ball. The Edinburgh Festival is a spectacular exercise of lies, hype and profiteering. An annual occupation by cunts for I thought cunts. this was uninternationalist of him. I thought he was uh, being chippy uh, because he wasn't on the same grounds. You could attack football and you could attack shopping centres and all sorts of things. Of course, it's a profiteering, spectacular event. Um, but, you know, our economies are, are transforming more in the direction of spectacle and of tourism. And my point then, uh, because I was talking a lot about touristification, over-touristification, um, the negative and the positive effects of that. The negative effects are obviously um, Airbnbs. You know, Edinburgh has a huge proportion per citizen of Airbnbs, twice as many as London has, for instance. And um, putting the rents up. Uh, and um, But the positive effect is, is that there is still an area in which you can be, as a citizen, free and playful and irresponsible uh, if you're a, a tourist. And I've lived as a tourist, really, for the last decade in Japan and found that freedom absolutely essential. I didn't want to have to go through the increasingly difficult processes of immigration, right to remain, all that stuff um, is becoming increasingly difficult, especially in Britain and especially the West. Japan is actually kind of going in the other direction, developing tourism enormously, uh, but also trying to make it easier uh, for skilled, at least, migrants to come in and, or, or people running supermarkets, whatever. There is a certain realisation that because of depopulation in Japan, they need to, to bring in more immigration. But anyway, the, the, um, the spokesman always being quoted in these articles in The Observer and The, the Guardian about the Hugmane problem with underbelly is Mike Small, who happens to be my brother-in-law. I've mentioned him before. Um, he's actually the grandson of the old minister from St. Cuthbert's Church. My sister married his brother, Steve Small, um, in the 90s, and uh, they were married at St Cuthbert's Church, which is right in the, the ticketed centre of Edinburgh, you know. So I, I could see Mike Small being incensed in a kind of Protestant. There is a, this relationship between being a Protestant and being a protester, being an activist. So I could see Mike Small coming from this <clears throat> fine Calvinist tradition of railing against authority, but in the name of a, a different authority, which is the Christian idea of, you know, what a, what a, 
it, it's an alternative, almost a Kafkaesque alternative world where the church might want to have its own authority in the center of town through big churches like St. Cuthbert's. Um, but then you have this entertainment, this spectacle company, uh, this administration of spectacle by companies like Underbelly. Underbelly sounds <laughs> suitably satanic and hellish, doesn't it? It sounds like this is the devil himself coming up to do his work of entertainment and uh, divertissement, you know, um, to distract people from their godly uh, better sides, their better halves. So this this night, and, and I do think of it in terms of <clears throat> repressive desublimation, um, toxic disinhibition, these are, these are things I always think about because I, I avoid the Sylvesternacht especially as, as far as possible. You know, it's, it's, it's increasingly scary to me. <clears throat> I jump every time people let off these huge bomb-like uh, things. I always remember that <clears throat> Berlin was the old capital of Prussia and the Prussians were known for their militarism. And of course, you know, <laughs> it was the center of the Nazi um, power sphere as well. So you know, there is this very um, disturbing side of the militarism. I contrast it very much with the Japanese New Year celebration or Christmas, the Christmas lights and the New Year celebrations in Japan. At Christmas in Japan, you basically go to a beautifully designed city center spectacle in which they've draped uh, light bulbs, LED light bulbs over the, the cherry trees by the Meguru River or um, along the Shibuya River, for instance, beautiful draped hanging lights just now and decorations, which people go to in very much the same Shinto spirit as um, they go to the other celebrations, looking at the autumn leaves, for instance, or looking at the cherry blossom in spring. It's one of the four seasons in Japan. It makes a great deal about having four seasons. They think they're the only country with four truly distinctive seasons, which is not true, of course, but it's part of the Japanese self-image. And um, But there's a, a delightfully peaceful... Uh, enchantment and and lack of menace. Uh, it's it's a, f a thing when you go to view these lights in say Meg uh, Nakameguro, along the river there where I used to live in in the early years of the century. Um, it's mostly young women. They're mostly taking photographs, which they're posting, of course, to Instagram and other places. So it's part of the, the spectacularization. I mean, in, in this year there was um, the, a new shopping centre in. Um, in uh, Shibuya, which opened and um, with an observation tower and stuff, but around the base of the uh, the skyscraper, right next to Shibuya Station, uh, there was um, a sound installation, sonic installations and things. So you could see all these things with the videos of Rambalak, who does amazing walking videos, just ambient videos in which he goes for a walk and, and videos maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half of walking around these landscapes. Uh, and a very quiet night streets, and then suddenly there'll be a, a sort of busy area and a spectacular event going on of some kind, and then he'll pass on, move on. So I, I watch these as an ambient backdrop to sort of to sort of escape a little bit the German ambience, which becomes oppressive for me after after too much uh, exposure to it. And um, it's delightfully gentle and delightfully aestheticized, uh, the Japanese celebration of the New Year. Oh, the New Year is a bit different because you go to a shrine. Uh, instead of first footing a neighbor, you go to a shrine and you pay, you make prayers to a Shinto deity or Buddhist uh, uh, figures. So sh Shinto, though, it's really Shinto. You go to a Shinto shrine the first day of the year and, or as, as close as you can to the first day of the year. So there are queues at the big Shinto shrines in Japan. Or, or I, would, I would like and now to be in Tokyo seeing the winter, the Christmas lights, um, as I did not last year, but the year before I was uh, in Tokyo for those. But let's go back to Guy Debord and the Situationists, because um, he really, he said so many amazingly prescient and, and relevant things about the way we've moved from, um, uh, from a sort of situation where we were uh, experiencing, I suppose he, he's, he's sort of romantic in the sense that there's an authenticity once in our relations with each other and our relationships with place, with cities, um, which has disappeared because spectacular um, appearances. It's a bit like Plato's metaphor of the cave, really, what he's saying. I live in a cave here. I, I sit here projecting you know, images of, of Roppongi or whatever on my wall when I'm living in Neukölln. Um, There's this kind of overlapping and kind of fantasy life which I, I live in. I love the, the cosmopolitan juxtaposition of um, images, um, 
but let's talk about what Guy Debord said. Uh, some quotes from Guy Debord. All that once was directly lived has become mere representation. Mere representation. So re- putting the, the spectacular and the representational on a, a lower footing, in a way. A, a sort of a romantic idea of authenticity and there being something real, which, which Debord kind of owes a bit to Sartre, sort of false consciousness or the inauthenticity that Sartre talked about. Um, so early industrial capitalism, according to Debord, remo- moved the focus of existence from being to having. So it's all about what you owned and who you owned. Uh, but post-industrial culture has moved that focus from having to appearing. So we get this kind of weird world where it's it's all about how you seem to be doing, rather than how you actually are doing. It's about how you, how well you can seem to be doing on Instagram, social media. Uh, I use Tumblr personally to to show my sense of my own ideal vision of my own existence, or these YouTube videos, you know, I use, this is a spectacular mediation of my, a self-projection of my ideal self and my kind of mental self um, into the real world. But I, it, it is with these images that we negotiate, more than with money even, I would say, we, we negotiate successfully or unsuccessfully with images which we can project um, of our lives. So, Instagram and TikTok and, you know, all these social media platforms exist for this haggling, this imagery haggling, this negotiation by visualization. And, and of course, if one is a good graphic designer, a good presenter of oneself, if one dresses in a particular way, one can do that perhaps more effectively. Uh, God knows I'm not anywhere near effective about it. I obviously lack the common touch because I don't, I don't have a million subscribers like Chris Broad, for instance, who does abroad in Japan, one and a half million subscribers, and therefore he has access to all sorts of celebrities like the rock star Hyde. He was recently hanging out with Hyde. He didn't say anything interesting at all about Hyde's music, but it's precisely in that lack of interesting analysis that, that his power lies. It's all simply, here's, here is imagery of me with Hyde. Here is Hyde answering a question I put to him, you know. What can you see in Hyde's expression about how seriously he's taking me, uh, uh, that I'm an influencer, you know, uh, Chris Broad obviously has, has parlayed up by using images on YouTube, this uh, status he has for himself as an influencer. Horrible word, but it is very crucial. Uh, and I think it's the economy we're going into is an attention economy, not a money economy. So being an influencer now is a bit like what being a millionaire or being a wealthy person would have been in the past. Talking of millionaires and talking of spectacle and the limits of what one can achieve by um, PR, and uh, I was looking at the the the, the death of uh, the lottery winner Colin Weir uh, recently, and he died this week, and uh, he was. Um, someone who, along with his wife Caroline, uh, won uh, 161 million pounds in. 2011, through the um, Camelot Euro Millions lottery. It was a rollover thing, so it was the biggest payout I think Britain had ever had to that point. And uh, there's a press interview in which he and his wife, who were both very blobby, physically very fat, <coughs> um, talked about what they were going to do. But they, basically all they said was, we, we, we didn't sleep that night and we haven't slept several nights since then. They were very inarticulate. He was a, Colin Weir was a, a STV um, cameraman most of his life, and then they bought this little house in Largs in Ayrshire. And um, when they won the 161 million, the first thing they did was buy a slightly larger house in uh, in, in Largs. And then they moved to Troon, um, an even larger house, uh, quite a grand house that used to belong to a tea merchant in Troon in 2014. Um, they had endless struggles with the council uh, because they would, you know, they would build garages and sort of sunrooms and, and demolish walls without planning permission, assuming that they would get the permission retrospectively. But the council decided to fight them on this, this old, old stone wall, which they pulled down and, and made them rebuild the wall. But they did a lot of really good things like uh, give um, donate a million pounds to the Scottish um, National Theatre or a million pounds to the SNP for the independence referendum in 2014. I think that's personally a, a great thing. Um, and um, and Colin was a bit of a f- fan of football, so he did. Uh, he gave a lot of money to um, Partick Thistle to establish a youth training ground, and um, 
things like that. So they were giving their money away in, in you know, to them judicious ways. But um, money seems to <laughs> seems to have ruined their lives in, in, in the end. I mean, Colin died at the age of 71, probably because of his physique and his, his, his um, you know, lack of attention to his health. I think they both lost some weight, but, but not nearly enough. Um, I don't know what he died of, probably some diabetes-related thing. I'm not sure, but um, 71 is a fairly... Fairly, unfortunately, a fairly average age for a working-class Scottish person to die at. Um, the, the life expectancy is enormously different depending on what social stratum you come from in Scotland. But uh, he and his wife, they divorced, um, they, it, he, it, and he moved out. He, he gifted his part in the, uh, the house in Troon to his wife and then moved uh, to his own place on the coast somewhere in Ayrshire. They never left Ayrshire um, which is funny because my, my sort of ancestors really, uh, or my other members of my, my family on my dad's side all live in Prestwick, which is also in Ayrshire, very close to Troon. It's just really a continuation of Troon to the south and Ayr. Air. My, both my parents went to Ayr Academy. So that's the, the part of Scotland we come from. And I think if I won 161 million, obviously I wouldn't stay in Ayrshire. I wouldn't stay in Scotland. I, I, I mean, I haven't lived in Scotland for decades, but... Um, I would go off and, and make an amazing house in Japan. Uh, but I don't know if even having a house um, appeals to me. I, I think it's very telling that, that people who win the lottery, first the first thing they do is usually they split up with their partner. Something inevitably, in men, obviously, uh, the, the sexual part of the male brain is like suddenly, oh my God, I could have any woman I want with this amount of money. And there's a kind of Faustian pact, a Faustian element to lottery win wins, which makes them fascinating. And and we see, first of all, the marriage breakdown, the properties separating, and, and, you know, conflicts with the authorities. Because, of course, not everything is possible when you have, just because you have a lot of money. There are still rules and regulations, and there are still all these people telling you what you can and can't do. There's the, and the time it takes to in, engage workers to build your dream house and to, to modify your dream house and all the rest of it. So management of, of the money becomes a huge thing. But um, so why, I don't know, why am I talking about them? I'm just thinking about them really in terms of the, the difference between the, the, what you can, I mean, they were pretty terrible at, at proje projecting uh, an image of happiness. First of all, they didn't really achieve happiness um, for themselves. They did contribute to other people's happiness by donating the money. And I think that's probably the, the sort of Christian message in there is, you know, if you do get a lot of money, suddenly give it to other people because that's what will make you happiest. It won't necessarily improve your life as much as you think. And, of course, the hedonic treadmill dictates that after about a year, um, you will, you will, your happiness levels will go back to normal. You will sort of take for granted your good fortune that, that buoyed you immediately after it happened and you will just sort of go back to a kind of ticking over happiness, or you'll realize that you're actually perfectly happy before, and that the money hasn't improved your life very much at all, if at all. <clears throat> so um, Christine sold a uh, Frognall house uh, in 2019 for less than she bought it for. Uh, I don't know where she lives now, but um, Colin is dead. Uh, Christine, a widow, um, I, think they, I, I think they divorced actually. Um, but Debor said about celebrity that the, the status of celebrity often, or, or he, he actually mentioned lottery wins. He said the status of celebrity offers the promise of being showered with all good things that capitalism has to offer. The grotesque display of celebrity lives and deaths is the contemporary form of the cult of personality. Those famous for being famous hold out the spectacular promise of the complete erosion of an autonomous, autonomously lived life in return for an apotheosis as an image. <clears throat> so I guess the image of the weirs would be that they're, they're, both, they're both blobby and, and large, and that gives them an everyman quality in today's Britain. And they're holding up this check, which says 161,642, you know, 161,642,000, blah, blah, whatever it is, um, pounds. And, and that is a kind of a fantasy sum of money. And that, that's the image. The image is that they're holding up this oversized check. Um, the ideological function of celebrity and lottery systems, says Guy de Boer, is clear. Like a modern wheel of fortune, which is the, the old Roman idea of fate and the wheel of fortune, the randomness of, of good fortune and bad fortune. Um, <clears throat> like a modern wheel of fortune, the message is all is luck. Some are rich, some are poor. That is the way the world is. It could be you. So... Um, there's a denial of the systematic nature of, uh, 
of he hegemony, you know, the domination by one class of the other. Uh, I think de Boer also says the whole point of um, our, our systems is to make the dominant class invisible. That is the class which one cannot name or talk about. Um, I suppose we'd call it oligarchy, the oligarchs. And, and that is what, when you see the property prices in Edinburgh going up, when the prices in all the rest of Scotland are going down, you see basically forming a, uh, an oligarchy, just as there is already in England and many other countries, especially America, um, this oligarchic structure of the increasing accumulation of wealth by a decreasing number of people. So this is what my, my good uh, brother-in-law is, is struggling against, and I, I absolutely um, support him in, in that struggle. Um, he's described as an activist, a writer and activist in these newspapers, like today's Observer. And um, he's certainly getting a spectacular status himself for, um, for being this kind of activist, this kind of protester or Protestant, if you like to <laughs> if you prefer the old-fashioned ministerial term. Um, I do support him, but, uh, but I also I have a... The only thing I have a, a sort of doubt about is, um, first of all, the repressive desublimation. The old, the old Hugmanay was kind of scary. Uh, it was kind of scary, although I got to kiss my neighbours, kiss these girls that I would never have dared to kiss other, at other times. Uh, there was something riot-like uh, in the 70s in Edinburgh, which was a bit like what we have in Berlin to this day. This sort of a sense that um, there's a nasty, there's obviously a nasty side. There is an underbelly. <laughs> Let's use that term, the name of the company that's organising the nice spectacular Hugmanay. There is an underbelly to the, the New Year celebration, which is that people, people especially at, at holiday periods, you see people's weirdness and their kind of unhappiness. Those who are weird and unhappy get even more so. I start getting weird emails from people. You know, I, I see people on the street. Somebody, I was walking in, in Berlin yesterday or the other day, um, and somebody just stopped and stared at me and started shouting at me because I was dressed funny or I really don't know why. But it, it was a little bit scary because this person was obviously mad. There are so many mad and disabled and kind of dissatisfied, disgruntled people around. And you really see them at this time of year. You see the people who are the, the rejects of the system, the losers, the, um, the weirdos. And that underbelly, something seethes out of that underbelly uh, into, the, into, the, into visibility, into spectacle. Uh, or in conflict with spectacle, because you have the spectacle, not so much here. Here in Berlin, you have like um, winter fairs, a lot of glue vine stalls, you know, that's this disgusting smelling um, um, spiced wine that people drink at this time of year. Um, actually, ironically enough, the, um, the German winter fairs, which now have spread all over the world, are for me much more satisfying and authentic, <laughs> inverted commas. In, in other words, they're more spectacular. Uh, in, in Japan than they are in Germany. So I, I would much prefer to be at Ebisu Gardens Place, you know, at a, a German style, um, there's a, they have a German style brewery there and they have a French chateau, you know, these fake plastic buildings from the postmodern period of say the 80s and 90s, uh, which somehow make a, a kind of desanitized, a, a sanitized and, 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 and um, spectral, spectacular uh, version of what of the idea of Germany or the idea of France, uh, which I find now very um, pleasant because it's in, in Japan especially it's in this harmonious calm and, and, and much less cold as well uh, because it's more temperate in Japan um, environment. I think that's all I, I can talk about today. I've probably um, gone on quite a long time. Open University. Thank you.